All right, we're going to be in the book of Philippians this evening, Philippians chapter number one. And aren't you grateful that Jesus never fails? He is faithful and true. Philippians chapter number one. And dad, you're brave tonight sitting up on the platform where everyone can see you. If you have to take a power nap, it's okay. <laughs> you guys can't do that, but we'll give him maybe a, a quick one if, if he needs one. I know he's a little jet lag. Looking forward to the time in God's Word together. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in the book of Philippians chapter number 1, and we'll begin reading in verse number 9. Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11. Verse 9 we read, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the morning that we had in your house, for the message that we heard from your word. And God, we pray that you would once again speak to our hearts, guide our thoughts as we study uh, this portion of scripture. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. This past Valentine's Day, I saw the lyrics to a song. It's a country song, a country love song that was written about 15 years ago. Never heard this song before. And uh, the lyrics go something like this. Uh, I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were going great until they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do. He said, you can't go on hating others who have done wrong for you, to you. Sometimes we get angry but we must not condemn. Let the good Lord do his job and you just pray for them. The country writer goes on to say, I pray your brakes go out running down a hill. I pray a flower pot falls from a windowsill and knocks you in the head like I'd like to. I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray that you're flying high when your engines stall. I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. Have any of you ever felt like someone was praying for you like that? You just had one of those days. Is someone praying for me like that? Well, what we find here in uh, God's Word is a letter from the Apostle Paul, and he offers a prayer. It's a, it's a prayer unlike the one I read just a moment ago. It's a different prayer. And, of course, the Apostle Paul, he's praying to the Lord on behalf of the church at Philippi. This is not uncommon. Paul does this in his letters. There are 31 different times where the Apostle Paul uh, pulls aside and offers a prayer, sometimes a prayer of gratitude or thanksgiving. Uh, often he prays for wisdom or for knowledge, for hope, uh, for peace, for unity, for power, for righteousness. He prays for growth in those who receive his letter, uh, purity. He prays for opportunities. And these prayers for us are instructive. We learn when we read these prayers. You know, often our prayers, and this is not wrong, our prayers, sometimes they revolve around uh, a physical need. Uh, sometimes they revolve around a financial need. Sometimes it's a, a relational need. Sometimes it's just a situation that we need a touch of God. And that's not, that's not wrong. The Bible says to cast all of our care for him, uh, on him, for he cares for us, the Bible tells us. Uh, you go a few chapters down and Paul even writes, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So you can't bring the wrong thing to God in prayer. But one thing that is instructive to us is what the Apostle Paul brings to the Lord in prayer. And here in this passage, he's not praying just for a physical need, although there were physical needs, or not praying just for a financial need, although there were financial needs. He's praying to a spiritual end. It's good to maybe pause and ask yourself, when's the last time you prayed for someone uh, for a spiritual need that they had or for a spiritual end? to see God grow in their life, or to see God do a work in their life. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He prays for love. He prays for love to be developed and to grow in the hearts of those of the church of Philippi. And we read of this in verse number 9. This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more. So let's examine the quality of our love in light of this prayer that the Apostle Paul brings. There's a few things I noticed. First of all, the Apostle Paul makes mention of a growing love. He said in verse number 9, that your love may abound yet more and more. Let's say those words together more and more. Ready to begin. More and more. That's the prayer of the Apostle Paul directed towards this church 
who is already, by the way, a loving church, he says, my prayer for you is that your love would abound more and more. Why pray for love? Now, why would he pray for, pray for love? You, you could argue that love is the greatest virtue. He, Paul uh, later wrote in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, he wrote, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, or the greatest of these is love. Why is that? Because faith, eventually our faith will become sight. Hope, eventually our hope will be realized, but love endures. Uh, and as he lists later in the book of Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit of the Spirit that we come to is love. Uh, in John 13, we read, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another, so that your love may abound more and more. So I believe this speaks, first of all, to the quality of our love, the type of love. He's speaking here of a biblical love, not a worldly love. Our world has a love that fades. Biblical love endures. Our our world uh, speaks of love in terms of a a feeling, but biblically we know that love is, is a sacrifice, it's a choice. We know that often the love our world speaks of is is cheap, but biblical love is costly, it is sacrificial. And love, it's been said, is our spiritual birthmark. Uh, 1 John 4, 7 says, He that loveth, uh, loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So if you know God and God's a work in your heart, you're going to love like God does. And what the Apostle Paul is praying here is that that love, that particular quality of love, God's love would grow in the heart of these believers. Warren Wearsby said, After all, if our Christian love is what it ought to be, everything else should follow. And that's really what the Apostle Paul is getting at, is if, if you love like you should, if you love the Lord as you should, then you'll love others as you should, and everything then just kind of falls into place. That's the quality of love, of our love, but we should also take note of the capacity of our love. Now, what is the object of the love as Paul is writing uh, in this letter? He doesn't necessarily uh, specify the object of his love. He doesn't say abound uh, uh, in more and more love towards me or to, towards this person. He, he, he doesn't specify, but the context here is towards other believers. If you just pull back a few verses, you see the love that Paul exhibits. Look at verse number seven. seven. It says, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds. So you're in my heart, even though I'm in a difficult situation. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are partakers of my grace. The next verse, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And so this love that Paul is speaking of is not a love that's foreign to him. It's a love that he has and he's expressing towards these other believers. He said, even though I'm in my bonds, I've got, I've got you in my heart. I have a love that's growing. It's, it's really fueling even this letter that I'm writing to you. So he exhibits this love, but then he encourages that love. He encourages for love to grow and develop in the heart of believers. And he says, and this I pray for you. Now, why is it helpful for Paul to verbalize that he's praying these prayers? Why is it helpful for him to tell the church at Philippi that he's he's praying for them in this regard. After all, he's praying to the Lord on their behalf. It's really, if Paul prays and God answers, that's all that needs to be done. Why why did the the church at Philippi, why do they need to be clued into this? Uh, What does the uh, Philippian believers have to do with this? Well, I think the answer is found in in the next, you don't have to turn, turn there, but in the next chapter we read, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Wait, who's working out their own salvation with fear and trembling? Well, go to the next verse and it says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his, his good pleasure. So cultivating and growing godly love is a joint effort. If it's only of God, that would suggest on our end just apathy, that we don't need to do anything to grow godly love. If it's all on us, that would suggest activism like we don't need God we can just grow in that love towards him but God grows that love uh, in a joint effort with us and that's why I believe the apostle Paul is telling the Philippian church this is this is what I'm praying for you so we can be in line with what God is doing and what God will do in your lives verse number six said uh, he speaks of the work that had begun in them uh, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ so essentially Paul is saying I'm praying for this in your life and you should be praying it as well. The words I'm praying for you are not words that we should use lightly. 
How many of you have ever been guilty of using those words lightly before? How many have ever promised to pray for someone and you forgot all about it? That's happened to me before. Uh, Paul doesn't use these words lightly. He's, he's, these, this is who he's bringing his petition, his prayers to, and the heart behind it is not something that he takes lightly. And so he says, I pray for you. I'm praying that God's love, that your love would abound more and more. This is not the only time he does this. We read of this in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Uh, he wrote, and the Lord make you to increase and to abound. Here's the point. There's no plateau uh, to the depth and the duration of biblical Christian love. We don't ever reach a point, uh, whether it be decades or multiple decades, where we've plateaued in our love for the Lord and our love forever for others. We can never reach a point where we've shown someone too much of the love of Christ. And I said at the beginning that the Philippians had already displayed abundant love. Uh, that Paul, Paul had recognized that. And he had realized that. And yet, he encouraged them to grow in their love. There's no cap. There's no limit to their love. Uh, I read the story of a Chinese art investor, Lu Yichen. And Lu Yichen bought a piece of art for $170 million. $170 million. There's the piece of art right there that he bought. What was interesting and what was noteworthy about this particular purchase is that he purchases this on the American Express black card, the Centurion card. If you know anything about the Centurion card, there is technically no limit. It's how they advertise this card. Uh, you cannot apply for this card. You are only invited to, the, this, to be a part of this card. I have not received an invite to this card at this point. <laughs> Uh, the annual fees are more than I could ever afford, and there's a lot of perks with the card, but, but technically they say that the card has no limits. Well, I started reading the fine print, and the fine print said, instead of a credit limit, uh, card holders have a spending ability, and they have a profile based on how much you are worth and what you can spend, and, and kind of if you read the fine print, there almost kind of is a, a spending limit. You know, some things in our world that are, uh, that are touted as like, no, this is, this is limitless. This is limitless. You read the fine print and you find there's a limit to it. I did that this last week with Olive Garden breadsticks. I was eating at Olive Garden and they bring out the, the breadsticks. How many of you enjoyed the breadsticks? And I was reading, are they really, really limitless? Like, could I sit here? You know what? You read the fine print. It's pretty awesome. In fact, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I read this. There was uh, a year back in 2014, Olive Garden didn't do well, the, do too well financially. The investors were upset. So they compiled a 300 page report of all the things that they could do better. Breadsticks had their own section. They, they, they did a whole research on the breadsticks and said, you're losing too much money on breadsticks. So that means a good deal for me. I'll continue eating the breadsticks. But you read the fine print there, even there's a limit to that, right? There's no fine print here when you speak of the love. When Paul is speaking that your love would abound and abound, there's, there's no exclusion clause. There's no fine print to this. Instead, we are to love and let our love abound. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, and abound towards one another, towards all men, even as we do towards you. We read uh, of the words of Matthew. You have heard that it has been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor, uh, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Then he says, but I say unto you, love your enemies. We, we saw this this morning as Jesus loved Judas, even those who would betray him. So we should have a growing love. That growing love is vertically towards the Lord and horizontally towards others. Even in the Old Testament, you look at the, the Ten Commandments. The, the first few uh, speak of our love for the Lord. The others are love for others. And so when our love falls into place, we will uh, grow and, and grow, as we'll see in just a moment here, in knowledge and in truth. So there's a growing love. And Paul says, I pray that your love is a growing love. But the second quality of their love that he prays for is that their love would be not just a growing love, but their, their love would be a guided love. You see, the depth and the duration of our love is not limited. There's no asterisk. There's no fine print to this. And our love should never... Uh, plateau. We should grow, increase, abound in love. Our love should not be limited in the terms of the depth of our love, but the direction of our love, how we love, who we love, what we love, that should be guided in knowledge and in all judgment. This is really, really important for us to understand. Our love doesn't just flow in every direction towards everything. 
Our love must be guided by knowledge and in all judgment. G.K. Chesterton wrote that love is not blind. Love is bound. And there And the more it is bound, the less blind it is. So the popular thought today is that love is blind. And what what the truth is here that we find in God's word, that no, our love is not just blind. It just shouldn't be blindly flowing in every direction. Our love should be bound by truth. There should be boundaries. There should be barriers to our love. I was reading about the L.A. River, and back in 1938, uh, there was a, one particular day where, where the Los Angeles area got a record amount of rainfall. Last month, you'll remember, we had a lot of rain, and one particular storm that we had last month brought just under two inches of rain in that particular storm over the course of a couple days. And it was a lot of rain. There was mudslides and things like that. But 1938, there was one day, just one day of rainfall set the record in Los Angeles. One day of rainfall was 5.88 inches. It's a lot of rain that fell. And it was catastrophic, catastrophic because at the time, the L.A. River just kind of flowed through L.A. Now, we, now, now we've seen the L.A. River right now, and now there's, now there's concrete barriers. I think we've got pictures here of some of the catastrophe that happened. This was a, a L.A. Times report from last month, and just talking about how, how many people would have died had those concrete barriers not been in place even just a month ago. But since they're there, it keeps the river in bounds. So our love for others... Our love, biblical love, has boundaries. And just like the banks of a river that take what is powerful and could be catastrophic and keeps them in bounds and harnesses even as a force for good, biblical love, likewise, must have banks to guide it. See, the the mantra today is that love is love. Love whoever, love whatever, love for whatever reason. Paul is not prescribing this type of love. And some would say even of, well, Christian, aren't you supposed to just be loving? Aren't you just supposed to love? We are to love and our love should grow and our love should abound, but our love has to be guided. We have, there must be boundaries of knowledge and discernment to this love. I'll tell you that there was more harm being done today in the name of affirming care than anything else in our world right now. Affirming care. There's evil, wicked, defiling actions in a world that just affirms, and it's a big, it's a buzzword, just affirm everything, love everything. Uh, Do you realize how catastrophic that is and is right now for the young people in our nation just to affirm and love everything in every direction? Sometimes the most loving thing to do is to say no, to point back to the truth. There is an advertisement, maybe you saw this, that ran during the Super Bowl just a few weeks ago. The advertisement cost millions of dollars. Uh, it was, there were several 60 second spots that were shown during the Super Bowl. And I think we got a picture here. It, it pictured, um, how many of you saw this, this particular commercial? So this commercial pictured uh, a, a, a number of politically set up scenarios where uh, there would be one individual who is uh, foot washing. In fact, the title of the commercial was foot washing. A number of politically skewed scenarios. They had, uh, I think one here is a picture of a a woman outside of an abortion clinic. In the background, you have uh, people protesting abortion and, 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 and protesting for life and against the killing of the unborn. But there's several scenarios like this. And, and, and there's a priest watching, washing the foot of a gay man. There's immigrants heading off a bus and they all skew one way politically. Um, but there's a few, there are a few problems with this, and I, and I would give, I don't know who created it, but maybe give them the benefit of the doubt that they're well-intentioned in their message, but it's confusing. It's confusing for a few reasons. First of all, there's no context, right? There's no context to this. It's just people washing Jesus' feet. Jesus didn't come just to wash feet. Amen. Jesus came, he preached repentance, he died for our sins. Uh, but the end of the commercial says, so you got all these scenarios, and it says Jesus didn't teach hate. The underlying message is that if you protest abortion, if you don't affirm everyone's sexuality, then you are a hateful person. That's the underlying message of the, the commercial. And, it, and by the way, it's meant to make, I'm sure, I'm, like I said, I don't know the motives behind who created it, and I'm sure it's made to, meant to make Jesus more appealing, uh, but that should never be the case. Jesus said they hated me. They're going to hate you as well. We don't have to try to make Jesus more appealing to our culture. I'm sure that was the mindset behind it. But and even that backfired. Business Insiders wrote an article that says that he gets this ad 
that ran during the Super Bowl preached the message of unity. Instead, it just made everyone more angry. Rolling Stones hated it. Salon Magazine hated it. The New York Times hated it. Uh, uh, AOC hated it. Forbes Magazine hated it, right? But it's this idea that, listen, if you, if you are truly a loving person, then you will affirm these, these things. No, our love has to have boundaries of truth and knowledge and discernment. You know, it's, love is one of the words that's being hijacked in our culture today. Love, generally speaking, uh, not just even a biblical sense, but generally speaking, love used to mean just goodwill towards others, right? And now, today, love is just to blindly accept whatever someone else believes, even if it contradicts reality. The gospel should carry an offense. We shouldn't work to make the gospel more offensive. I think we can follow Jesus' example. He was a friend of sinners. He showed care, compassion towards people that were lost and in need of a Savior. I think of his encounter with the the woman caught in the act of adultery. He said very gently to her, but firmly, uh, go and sin no more, neither do I condemn thee, right? And that is the message of Jesus. He, he, He was full of grace and truth, but he never compromised truth. So God, right, let's, let, we're talking about love. Who established love? We, we talk about these terms that are hijacked. Love is a biblical concept that God gave us, that God displays for us, that God defines for us. So what does God say about love? God says that love rejoices in truth. It doesn't avoid the truth. It doesn't rejoice in whatever you want to do. It rejoices in truth. And so what are the, what are the boundaries? What are the, the banks of this river of our love that should flow more and more? Biblical knowledge would be number one. Paul said biblical knowledge. In Hosea we read that people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee. There's a report that's done every two years. It's called the State of Theology. And it's run, I believe Lifeway Research does all of the research data behind it. There's over 3,000 individuals that are polled every couple years in this report, and they track some of the trends. There was a question that was asked, does God change? Does he learn or does he adapt? 48% of people agreed that God did change. 43% disagreed. Uh, the Bible tells us in Malachi 3.6, for I am the Lord, I change not. So we have a culture that's moving further and further away from what even the Bible teaches. And what we're seeing is the people who are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The answer's there. It's very clear that God doesn't change. And yet we have a society that's drifting further and further away from uh, these truths because they're drifting away from knowledge. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Uh, Another question was was posed, are we born uh, innocent? 65% agreed that we're born innocent. We're not born with a a sin nature. Uh, The psalmist wrote, David wrote, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and my sin, and then sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, So again, the the answer is clearly here in God's word, but we've drifted from God's word. We've drifted from biblical knowledge. Here's another one. It said, The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. These were some of the, the hallmark findings. They said these are some of the trends that really stick out. And this one says, so the Bible's sacred, contains some truths, not literally true. Look how the trends have gone from 2014, 41% agree to 2022, 53% agree that the Bible would, or would say that the Bible is generally a good book, but it's not absolutely true. Uh, there's another, uh, another one here. Uh, next slide uh, is... Uh, that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam. This was interesting, as they pair the, 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 the national findings alongside the Christian re, uh, findings as well. And what's sad is a lot of times that the Christian findings aren't too different than the national findings. So here is an evangelical finding that would say, and you can see the trend from 2016, this is one of the alarming trends, that 56% agree. This is, this is of Christians, people who would profess to be a believer that Jesus isn't the only way. The Bible tells us to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To grow in grace and to grow in knowledge. There's a term you, you're familiar with it. You've heard it before. How many of you have heard of the term life hack before? Here's a life hack. That is a popular term now. It hasn't always been popular. In fact, it was coined in 2004 was the first time that someone used the term life hack at a technical conference in 
San Diego, and now it's just common verbiage. You know, we got these life hacks. In fact, on a lot of social media platforms, I think TikTok was one of them, that, that has life hack as one of the top trending hashtags all the time. People are always looking for life hacks. How many of you like a good life hack? You find a good life hack, you're like, oh, that's neat, and then we never use it. But it's still neat to see what you can, what is a life hack, if, if you don't know, a life hack is a, it's a trick or shortcut skill. It's a novelty method that increase, increases productivity, efficiency, and all walks of life. Well, here's the point. There's no life hack to biblical knowledge. You can't life hack your way into an increased knowledge and a deepened understanding of the Lord. We understand the Lord through time spent in his word, by saturating our mind in his word, by spending time with him in prayer. Knowledge, by the way, knowledge cultivates love but never replaces love. We never get to the point where we, where we grow in knowledge that we replace the need for love. No, our love should fuel knowledge and our knowledge should fuel love. It's been said it's possible for a man to love God knowing little about him. How many of you remember when you first got saved? You didn't know a lot the theologically, but you know that Jesus loved you enough to send his son, uh, that God loved you enough to send his son Jesus to the cross to die for you. And that prompted love in return for him. We love him because he first loved us, right? And, and it's possible to love God with very little knowledge. But the more we know about him, every new thing we learn of him is a new reason to love him. When we come to this, when we come to, the, to this uh, auditorium, when we open God's word, when we open God's word in private at our, home, at our homes, uh, we grow in knowledge to grow in love, which... Uh, then spurs in our heart a desire to grow again in knowledge and in love. So biblical understanding, uh, biblical knowledge. But the other bank would be spiritual understanding. We read in knowledge and in all judgment. So with knowledge and understanding or discernment, where does that bring us? So this river of love that flows with the banks being biblical Knowledge and spiritual discernment, where does that bring us? It brings us to the truth of God. We read that ye may approve things that are excellent and that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. And we're to test things, we're to prove things with the knowledge and the discernment that we've had as we've grown in love. Now we're going to prove things according to that knowledge and discernment. The word here used is that we want to see if it's sincere. That word sincere is an interesting word, and it means literally without wax, without wax. What, is, what does that mean? Well, in, in biblical times, when someone was, in ancient times, when someone was going to sell a statue, like a marble statue, if the statue had been dropped uh, and there was maybe a nick or a cut or a scrape in that statue, sometimes what would happen is they would, they would put wax in the cracks, or they would take a little chunk of marble that was mis missing and they would put wax in it. And so if you, were, if you were astute and you were going to buy a piece of work like this, you would take that portrait or that model, uh, that, uh, that statue, and you would bring it out into the sun. It would reflect a little differently, and if it's out in the sun long enough, it would start to melt, and you would see it's not sincere. It's, it's not authentic. And so our love for him as it grows within the boundaries of love and discernment must be sincere. Uh, right, correct, without offense, authentic until the day of Christ. So we see this growing love. Our love should be growing. We see this guided love that our love should be, uh, have boundaries to it, not just in every direction towards everything, uh, but that we're going to prove the love. We're going to test our love. But then we see finally this glorifying love, this glorifying love. So what is the result of a love that is growing, a love that is guiding is God gets the glory. This is the point of our love. Not so, sometimes we love things because they're lovely to us. We love things because they're cute, because they're fun. That's not why Jesus loved us. Jesus loved us in that while we were yet sinners, there was nothing lovely about us. But when we love others like Jesus loves us, God gets the glory for that. When our love for others and our love for him grows, God gets the glory for that. When our love flows through knowledge and discernment, God is glorified. Look at verse number 11. And being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. 
So being filled with the fruits of love, this is the end goal of love. This is the point of our love so that we can be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of Jesus Christ. So there's two things I want to draw your attention to here. That the righteous, righteousness will bear fruit. Here, here's the end of our love, that we may bear fruit in righteousness, being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Well, what is that fruit? Well, we find it all throughout Scripture. I think of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter number 6. The fruit of holiness, Romans chapter number 6. The fruit of souls, Proverbs uh, 11 verse 30. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we're told to be fruitful in every good work. And that the fruit of praise from our lips is found in Hebrews chapter number 13. So why do we love others? Not just because we feel good or someone else feels good. We love others so God gets the glory in our loving. It's the fruit of righteousness is the result of loving. Now, if you just skip the love and you just go right for the fruit of righteousness, listen, like the fruit of the Spirit, we don't grow the fruit, but we can make sure that the, the environment is right. We can cultivate a heart that, that God can use and cultivate a love that God can grow for His glory. So we see the fruit of righteousness, but then the end here is the furtherance of the gospel. That ye be filled with the fruit of fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, unto the glory and praise of God. Now, I mentioned this. We love to talk about love. I, I, I read a report that said 67%, 67% of all Western songs ever written, any genre, any decade, the best, the best estimate is that 67% of all songs have to do with love. So we talk about love. We love to talk about love. Paul talks about love, and he talks about love often. But it's not just an easy love. And that's where Paul, that's where we'll end here tonight in verse number 12, because Paul says to these believers, my prayer for you is that your love would grow and grow, that it would abound and that it would, it would grow more. And that in that, you would have knowledge and discernment and, and, and towards the end of fruits of righteousness. But then he says in verse number 12, but I would, ye should understand. He's saying, I'm not just trying to paint a rosy picture for you of what it like, looks like to love, like the world does with every love song. No, I want to I show you what it means like and what it looks like sometimes to, to love God and live for the glory of God. I would not that ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. Paul says, Here's, I want you to know that this is what it looks like. To love others as God has loved others, to love God as we should, to grow in that love is not always easy. Sometimes it's difficult, and sometimes it's not popular. And sometimes, here as the Apostle Paul says, I'm, even, I'm in my bounds. I love you, I'm praying for you, but he references uh, his bonds that he is in. So that in my bonds, this is the second time he references in Christ, are manifest in all the palace and in other places. You see, the other thing that he does, is he, and he does this twice in this passage, he uses the phrase here, the furtherance of the gospel, then you, uh, you back up into verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number, I believe verse number 10. That ye may approve things which are excellent, that ye may be as sincere and without offense. And then it says this, till the day of Christ. He says the same thing in verse number six, uh, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So our love for others is not just for right now. There's a, there's a, there's a future purpose of that love for the glory of God, not just for now. Now listen, God will bless it, God will use it, and God will get the glory for it, but it's not just for now. Uh, it is until the day of Christ. It is an enduring love. It is a glorifying love. My wife has been reading a book on Corey Ten Boom. I think my mom read the same book. And Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch watchmaker. Along with her sister Betsy and father, Corey helped many Jewish people escape the Nazis during the Holocaust and World War II by hiding them in her home. Uh, when they were caught, she was arrested and sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp. In her famous book, The Hiding Place, uh, which is her bi biography that recounts the story of her family's efforts and how she found and shared the hope of God while she was in prison at camp, uh, she spoke about some of her uh, time at the concentration camp. 
Only 20% of the women even came out of the concentration camp alive. So they would try to cheer them, each other up. Uh, they would say to each other, nothing could be worse than today. But then she wrote, we would find out that it was possible that sometimes other, some days were worse than others. But she was treated very unkindly. Uh, that, that would be an understatement. Uh, to be beaten, to be brutalized. And she wrote, even as I saw the angry and vengeful uh, even as she saw this unfold, the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me. I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Who was, uh, was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, help me forgive. Uh, Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. She wrote, Jesus, I cannot forgive him, but give me your forgiveness. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than it is on our goodness, that the world's healing hinges but on his. And then she said this, And when he tells you to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. You see, a growing love doesn't originate with us. Uh, don't walk away from here tonight thinking you need to muster up a love. It is God's love flowing through us. It is love on loan from God. It is God's love flowing through us. She wrote, we must mirror God's love in the midst of a world of hatred. We are the mirrors of God's love, so we must show Jesus by our lives. It's his love until the day of Christ. What's the quality of your love? Is it a growing love? Is it a love that you can say honestly uh, from day to day, from year to year, my love has increased and abounded more and more? Is it a guided love? Teenagers, we don't just love anything and everything. There's truth, there's discernment, there's knowledge. And this is what guides our love. And we can love as Jesus loves, but we don't just affirm everything. There's, there's knowledge and there's discernment alongside the banks of our love. But in the end, we don't love others to look good, to feel good, to make someone else look good or feel good. We love for the glory of God. And when we do that, He gets the glory and we get to experience the fruit of righteousness in our lives.